uh, want to just share a couple things. Um, most of you saw over the, what, the last four weeks some of the devastation that happened out in California with the fires and all that that was going on there. And uh, um, I got to thinking, man, surely New Life could do something. We could, we could do something to make a difference. And, and then um, my, my thoughts came more home. I mean, right here. What happens if we have a, a disaster here, a fire, a flood, uh, something where families, it could be one house, it could be whatever. And, 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 and so what I, what I would like to do is I'd like to make a big ask of our church and, and just to ask in this form. Typically, when somebody goes through an emergency where there's a flood or a fire or something like that, they need something right now, I mean, in a hurry to help them. And so I would love if some of you would be willing to purchase a, a gift card, two gift cards, so we could put them in the safe so that we just, if it happens any time during the year, we just have a, a resource ready we could put in somebody's hand here, go get some groceries, get some clothes, pick out the shoes that you want. Um, and, and those kind of things. And then I want to kind of step it up just one notch further if I can. So obviously we have that need, and this is not something you're going to hear me ask for again. So I just know that, that I'm just asking this one time. If you could do that and like to help, please do that. And then the other part of that is we've got one of our members, Mike Rice. And most of you know who Mike is. If you don't, really doesn't matter as far as that goes. But Mike has had a passion for disaster relief for years and years and years. And and so he's wanted us as a church to develop a disaster relief trailer. And in fact, he came to me, I don't know, a year or so ago, and he said, Jim, do you care if I just start buying stuff to, to you know, stock up a, a disaster relief trailer? And so he's purchased, I don't know, three or four chainsaws and some other things, just starting to get ready. So if there's a disaster, we could cut up the wood, we shovel so we could go shovel mud out of somebody's basement, if there's that kind of thing. And so I'm just saying that. He's already started it, but I would love if, if somebody has a way. We don't have the resources. We don't have it budgeted. We don't have anything along that line. But we would love to find somehow to get a trailer that could be New Life's disaster relief trailer so that in a moment we could, we could send out a crew that could go work and help and do those kind of things. And so that's going to entail, one, we're going to need a trailer. Two, we're going to need the stuff to stock the trailer. Three, we're going to need trained men and women, right? We need people that will be willing to be trained and, and, and go through that. And so if you have an interest that sparks a fire in you, I can connect you with Mike, and uh, we'll, we'll start that process rolling. And so there's been no deep plans. It's just been something I told the elders. I asked their permission if it was okay just to, to, to do this and mention it. And, and it, it was just something that's on my heart. It's something that, that, that this is something we could help in a practical way and, and to be a part of that. And so does that sound like a good idea to you guys? And so... Amen. Participate. Uh, most of you know we do a we do a thing called difference makers, and uh, um, we 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 kind of single out a, a few people in our church periodically, and we just give them a jar full of candy that says difference maker on the front. But 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 we we want to be different to make a difference. Well, today I want to kind of single out three of our our young adults, if you will. And so, Megan, I'm going to see you over here. I want you to stand to your feet right now. You didn't know it, but we're going to single out Megan right here. Where's Kyle and Nick back here in, on the camera, guys? If y'all wave your hand, we've got. Listen, all all three of these folks, they they serve tirelessly. They're here every week recording. They're participating, and we we're serving the community and and do incredible stuff. And so, you know, Kyle, Nick, listen, Megan, thank you for being difference makers. Um, and and, I, and we don't want to embarrass people, but but yeah, a little bit we do. But uh, but more than anything, folks, we want we want people to notice when somebody's making a difference in other people's lives. You know, um, we've got a, a church full of people doing just that. And so thank you very much from the bottom of our heart and do that. And so, um, guys, um, I'm just going to jump into the message and do it. Uh, a couple weekends ago, I, I preached a message where uh, I, I did, did what the Apostle Paul calls the message of the cross, right? And, 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 and we, we asked people to to do something at the end of that message where we said, we want you to make the great exchange. In other words, I'm going to exchange my sin for your grace. I'm going to exchange my mess-ups, my foul-ups, my heart. And we had about 12 people at the end of that message that raised their hand and said, yes to Jesus. And I mean, incredible, incredible day. Last week, we, we, we kind of did it and we talked about the 
more about the message of the cross and, and examining our life based on the cross. And, and, and we came down to it, and I said, listen, if you have trusted Christ, you haven't been baptized, you want to declare it and come and come bring your card saying, hey, I want to get baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. And we had about 12 more people come and put their card last week, which, is, you know, it's a big deal coming up in front of everybody, right? I mean, it's, it's a little unnerving. And, and, and folks, I, I, I went home from that um, excited, you know, just what, what in the world? I mean, this, this God's stirring in people's lives. And, and listen, I, 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 want to, I, want, I want to say this to you because this is how I felt when I went home. When, when, when you see people surrendering and, and letting God change their lives because of the cross, man, this is holy ground. You under, I mean, I, 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 I say, say this with such caution because... It doesn't happen everywhere where God is stirring in people's lives. I, I want you to understand that this is something pretty special that we need to honor and we need to, to celebrate uh, with that. And, and, and I, I had one dad that came up to me and, and after the service last week. We had him come up and, and we had a, a great little conversation. But he said, he said Jim, I, I was baptized as an infant in the Catholic Church and my wife's never been baptized. And and, 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 and listen, it's an honor, it's an honor for me to be able to say, man, I get to be a part of this with my church family. You know, and I said, that's awesome. You know, I had, I had a, a, another gal that said, every time I think about getting baptized, she says, I get chills and I get excited. And I, I, I'm praying that my mom and my sister will be here today and hopefully they'll be here, be a part of that. Another grabbed me on Monday and said, I was thinking about my son all during your message. And, and, and that afternoon, I got a text from him telling me, me and my husband, that we're the reason that he's got a solid foundation. And every single day, he thanks God that, uh, that, 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 that he gave parents like them to him. Another grabbed me and said it was just time for me and my fiancé to get it done. In other words, get it baptized. He said, I want Jesus as my foundation. I want others to know. And then in his next breath, he told me, he said, I just want to allow Jesus to lead our career decision. And, and, and I'm looking for how to discern his leading. Folks, I, I, I'm just saying this to say, man, God's working through this church. He's working in this church. And, and, and I think it's pretty special. And so... Um, I, I hope that, that you understand that, but sometimes when we come to stuff like this about letting God change us, there's things going on inside of us that are they're, they're, they're deeper. You can't even see them. You can't even see the, 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 the what's going on. And so I'm going to do something a little bit unique and a little bit different today. I don't know if, how it will fly, how it won't fly, but, 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 but you see the cross here, and today I... I've scattered literally, I don't know, 1,500 or so pennies that have a cross cut out in the middle of them. And, and, and here's what I'd like to ask today. I'm going to ask that during my message, this is going to seem really strange, right? I'm going to ask you to stand up where you are. If you've got something in your life that, man, you want, you want to be marked by the cross, I'm going to ask you to come forward and just grab a penny. I'd love if every person came by and got one. But I want you to pause if you need to touch the cross, touch it. Let it mark you. If you need to, to kneel right here on the floor, I, feel free. You know, if you want to grab, I'm going to have uh, Tracy and Ryan. Ryan's in here somewhere. He's going to be around here. But I, I've got a couple people that are going to be here. If you want somebody to pray with you, I mean, they'll pray a whisper prayer. It's not something to embarrass you. But, but, but folks, I, I, I want you to, to, to be marked by the cross. So the penny, the reason the, I found a little ministry of a, an older man, it's his ministry now, and he, he stamps out these crosses and pennies. And, and literally, I want you to, when you get back to your seat with it, I want you just to do it. Just hold it out there and try to focus on somebody just, or something and do it. And, and you'll, what, what you're going to find is it's not very much in focus. You can't see it very well. But literally, as you bring that cross to you, things become very clear. I, I want everybody with me on this. You let the cross come close to you. It's there. Inside your program, I forgot to bring one up. There's a, the baptism card, but on the back of that card, I want everybody to look at it. And there's, there's simply a place on there. It says something along these lines. I don't know the exact wording I had Jackie put on the card, but is, is, what is it that's 
that's keeping you from a cross-focused life, a cross-centered life. And as you come up, I I want you just to maybe write what it is that's keeping you from a cross-focused, a cross-centered life. I mean, it, it could be as simple as, for me, if I, the things I always have to put, TV. You know, what is it for you? It could be selfishness. It could be greed. It could be anything. What, what is it that's in, in the way of that? And so I'm, I'm just going to simply invite you right now. Anybody that wants to come, you feel free to come. Anytime during this message, you can come between services. I, I, I'm really not in concern of that. But I, I want a church full of people that say, man, the cross is what marks my life. It's what, what we're about and to do it. And so you feel free to come and you do it at any time during this message. If you want to pause and pray, you, you do so, um, Will. And, and Ryan, if you and Tracy would just in a moment, if anybody wants to pray with them, you feel free. They're right here. Grab them and they'll be, be glad to be a part of that um, with you. And so part of this weekend with cross-focused life, we're going to be baptizing people. And I, I don't know about you, I'm kind of excited about that. We've got a few in this service that are set up and planning to be a part of that. And, and, and with that, but for some of us in the room, you may have never seen a baptism ever in your life. And so as a part of that, what I'd like to do is just to explain a little bit about what that's about, if I can, and kind of do it. And so um, you can understand it. And first of all, baptism is an expression in a public way of somebody who's put their trust in Jesus and become his follower. That's all it is. It's a, it's a public thing. It's a discriminant. The water that they're going to be baptized in is just a symbol for cleansing, and that's part of why it gets used. And so it's just symbolic of what's taking place. And so what happens when you get baptized is an, it's an expression of the fact that, that, that in Jesus you get a new story. Now, now, let me say that again. It, it's, a, it's a description that when in Jesus, you get a new story. See, a lot of us, we, we really wrestle with that. I don't have a story. I don't have it. Oh, yes, you do. In Jesus, you get a brand new story. Everything changes. It's all a new beginning. And so in this series, Cross Examine, I want you to understand, if you're still breathing, go ahead and look at the person next to you. Are they breathing? I mean, is their heart still beating? If they are, then you still, you still have a story. You have a chance for God to do a change and a work in you. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10. Paul said, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. Now notice this. This is kind of strange terminology, and we need to unpack it. They were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What in the world is that talking about? I mean, it, it, it's really kind of a, a, a bizarre language when you look at it, but, but you might not know that baptism in the Old Testament was not done the way we do it now. It wasn't done in the same way, but Paul was using this story as a picture, as an image, and so when he talks about Israel getting baptized with Moses in the cloud, he's referring to quite a, a, a famous story in the Old Testament. And so for God's people, for Israel, the primary and the central narrative of their history has always been in the story of their deliverance, the story of them being set free from captivity. It's what marked them. It's what moved them. In fact, a rabbi by the name of Michael Goldberg, he says that the exodus was for Israel um, what the crucifixion would become for Christianity. And, and what that is for Christianity's crucifixion, it's the central story. It's the focus of, of, of the narrative of what goes on in life. And so for Israel, it was a time when they were in bondage, and it was cruel, it was oppressive. Um, I, I think it would be fair and safe to say it was almost genocidal in how, how it was coming. It was, it was awful. It was awful. For 400 years, they experienced that, and they cried out to God, and God heard their cries, and he cared. And God raised up a leader, and his name was Moses. Most of us know this story, but for those of you that don't, I want you to listen close. And and God intervened for little Israel, and he did it by bringing the plagues into Egypt. And and, and we don't have time to unpack all that, but the mighty Pharaoh's will, it was what? It was broken. And finally, he, he relented, and he finally said, okay, let them go. Let these people go and set them free. And that's exactly what, what took place. And so God was leading Israel in a quite a unique kind of way. If you look, if you will, at Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it, it, it says that the Lord went ahead of them 
in the cloud to guide them in their way. And I, I don't know exactly what all this means and how it worked, but it says there was a pillar of cloud. And the, 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 literally in that cloud, that's where the present presence of the omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God was in that cloud. He was leading them. And, and God, through that cloud, he led Israel. And where did he lead them? He led them out of captivity in Egypt, and he led them right to the edge of the Red Sea. Right? right? I mean, y'all, y'all, y'all know this story for some part, but they started out this journey very bold and very courageous. And, and, and then in Exodus 14, 8, it says the Israelites were marching out boldly away from Pharaoh, but Pharaoh changed his mind. Right? In other words, he let them go. No. Uh-uh. And he started after them. He started pursuing them. And so the armies are doing the very next verse, verse 9, the Israelites see Pharaoh and his army's coming after them. And, and so they know they're trapped where? Here's the army of, of, of Egypt, the Egyptians coming, the Red Sea's in front of them, the mountains on the side. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. And, and, and Moses tells the people what God's plan is for them next. Right? Remember, he's leading them. And you remember what he tells them? I want you to step into the sea. I want you to step into the water. Okay? Are, are anybody following me? I mean, it, it, which, which symbolized almost certain death. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. And we wonder now how bold they would be. And it says in verse 10 that they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die. What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. I mean, you think, oh my gosh. See, here's the only crazy part. They say, didn't we tell you this? No, they didn't tell him that. Go back and read it. They, 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 they literally did not tell him that. They were saying, we want to be set free. We want to be delivered. But now here they are. They're, the deliverance is happening. What are they doing? They're simply, yeah, I wanted, but I didn't bargain for this. I, I wasn't in on this part of it. That wasn't what I was looking for. And it looked like their story, their story was going to end before it ever began. You ever felt like that? Ever felt like your story is going to end? Then Moses said these amazing words to the people. Verse 13, it says, do not be afraid. Say that out loud with me. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. Let's hear it. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. And then it says, the Lord will fight for you. Somebody here needs to hear that. The Lord will fight for you. You can't fight yourself. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to do what? To be still. Some of you need to hear the words right now. You need to be still. God's going to fight for you. He's going to be the one that's going to see you through. And and, and so it may be that privately Moses felt just as panicked and freaked out as the people did because God immediately says these amazing words to Moses. He says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. What do you mean move on? Step into the water. Step into the, the sea where the place where the sea was move on. I mean, this is crazy. Moses, hold up your staff. I mean, come on, the leader had to be to move out in boldness too. Hold up your staff. I mean, folks, I'm I'm gonna tell you it's scary to follow after God. I'll part the waters, it's gonna be okay. And so somehow, somehow this right on the brink of where the water was, the leader held up his staff, and God sent the winds, right? It says the water's parted. There were walls of water piled up on the right and on the left. And he wanted them to step between the walls of water. You say, Jim, do you really believe that? Yeah, I do. I really believe that. I believe that God's word is authoritative, that it's true, that it's inerrant. I, I absolutely, I'm one of those weirdos that believe that it's exactly what God says it is. It's his truth. It's his word. But literally, they had to step out into the water where it was, right? I mean, freaked out, scared to death. A lot of times, the the, the biggest miracles happen when we step out and trust God in the midst of our fear. (laughs) Not because we don't have any fear, because we act in spite of the fear, and and, and we get moving and stirring in that. And so going down into the water, it looked like death to them. 
Now, and it was. So, so, so you can write these things down. They were dying to their old identity, who they were. Listen, it, it all changed there. They were going to have to die to their fears, the fears were the, that were there. They were going to have to die to an old way of life. And I think this is why Paul talked about this and brought it up because when they would come up out of the water, listen to me, when they come up, they walk through the walls of water, they're heading up the other bank, and they're coming up. When they came up out of the water, they came out into something new. It it was totally different because with God, your story is never over. Your story is never over. They trust God and they step into the sea. God parted the waters. They passed through the sea on the wall of water, and then the, the enemies pursued after him, and then what God do? Whew, he let the waters come together, and the whole Egyptian army was taken in through it. And so when they come up out of the water, this is important for understanding what Paul is talking about in, in relation to baptism. They stepped into a new reality. Somebody here needs to hear me. They, when, when, when they stepped into the water, and when they came up out of the water, they stepped into a whole new reality. And so when they went down into the water, they were what? They were slaves. When they stepped out of the water, they walked into the freedom that God had given them. When they walked down into the water, they were in mortal danger. But when they came up, they were in perfect safety in the hand of God. That God took care of them. When they went down into the water, they lived just like everybody else in the ancient world. But when they came up out of the water, they came up to what? To go get and receive the new covenant that God had made with them. They came to receive the Ten Commandments of how to live and how to have a life that was totally transformed and totally changed. When they went down into the water, they were terrified. But when they came up out of the water, the the, the Bible says they were dancing, literally dancing. In fact, I'll just say that the next chapter in Scripture is thought to be the first hymn ever sung that that was done. And and, and a prophet, prophetess, I guess you should say, by the name of Miriam, it was Moses' sister. She penned and wrote this song, and all of Israel sang it. And, the, and it's part of the words where the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The Lord, he's my strength. He's my song. That's why, hey, 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 how many of you have ever seen a baptism here at New Life? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I love, and you'll even see me encourage people if they, it doesn't just happen instinctively, but literally, yes! When they come up out of the water, you ever see this? Yes! And, and they say, why? Because there's something, sometimes you can't even speak it. What's going on? You, 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 you know you want Jesus to be your strength and your song and your story of salvation. But when you come up, out, it, it's, I, I don't think I can have a new story. But sometimes when people go through it, they realize, man, I can have a new story. God can rewrite and redo and repin the things of what he wants to do in my life because they've experienced the victory of God. And folks, this is holy ground. It's not something to be treaded on lightly. And and, and sometimes we feel like something's holding me back or I'm holding out on God myself, my selfishness. There's things that I'm just holding. But listen, when you finally step out in obedience, it doesn't mean you're not afraid. Doesn't mean you're not scared to death. (laughs) Doesn't mean that that you're not shaking and quivering. But listen, when you step out in obedience, man, somehow God does uh, uh, beautiful things. And that change, that new story is there. And so when they come out of the water, there's this realization that God's love and his forgiveness and his grace, they're mine. They belong to me. Folks, I, I don't know if you get this part. They're 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 mine. And and God, the beautiful thing about baptism, every time you see one, it's God just reminding you, look what I did for you. Look what I did for you. Our God is so absolutely amazing. And, And when the children of Israel took that step of faith, I mean, listen, they didn't have a story. They didn't have a God story. Listen, but here they are, when they stepped in, they they could have said, I've heard about Abraham and Sarah. I've heard about Joseph and how God delivered him, but that was a long time ago. I don't know that story. That's not my story. But when they went through in obedience on their own, they came up out of the water. They now had a story. Are y'all following me? There's something radically different that takes place. And when they came up out of the water, now they had a story of their own. It was theirs. Now listen, I'm going to ask this question to every person here. Do you have a story, a God story of your own? 
Not somebody else's story. Not your mom and daddy, not your, not your, your husband or your wife. Listen, do you have a story of your own where God has stepped in? And because when they went down into the water, they felt like victims and like slaves, and they came up literally with a new identity. And it, it's such a beautiful picture in this thing called the Exodus. That, that, that God, it, it paints a picture for us that, that is like none other with that. Exodus 1.15, I want you to see See this, the, 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 the king, the Pharaoh, he, he put out an edict to, listen, I want, you, I want you to kill every firstborn male. I want you to, I want you to eliminate them. And, and, and here it is, Exodus 1.15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose names were Shipra and Pua, if you see that the baby is a boy when you're delivering a little Hebrew baby, look at this, kill him. Wow, they're multiplying too fast. Those thinking... Israelites are like rabbits, right? I mean, they're just reproducing and reproducing. And, and if we're not careful, this is going to get out of control. This is, this is going to become an issue. And, and here's the deal. Shipra and Pua, the midwives, they defy the Pharaoh. I mean, you just don't do that. You don't, you don't do it. And so in an act of extraordinary heroism, they, they, they risked their own lives. They defied the king and don't do it. And when the, when, the, when the Pharaoh calls them in to really call them to account, they, said that's, they, they gave the same thing. Those, those Israelites, they just multiply too fast. They have babies too quickly. They're, they're, they're reproduced. And, and there's, a, there's a telling detail in, in this story that, that you could miss by just running past it. But, but, but listen, let me, let me ask you the question. What was the name of the Pharaoh that gave that edict? Anybody know? You know me tell you? Nobody knows. You know why? It's not recorded. It's not recorded, which was totally on its head from what happened. Everybody knew who the Pharaoh was. Everybody knew what was going on, and nobody knows his name. It's like, it's like God was saying, saying, Pharaoh who? I don't know who he is. I don't have a clue what was going on. The, the, the text does not say it with that. But, but listen, the, the midwives, midwives were servants to the slaves. They were less than nobodies. They were less than nobodies in the scripture here. Nobody, listen, I, I, I'll just say that, but we have their names recorded for us. But, but listen, lots of people name their kids after Bible people, right? But you never hear anybody like, here's my daughter, little Pua. Doesn't happen. Why? Because it's a really weird name. I don't know. But, 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 but listen, but God said, Pharaoh who? But you're going to remember Pua, right? In, in my lineage, in my line, she, she, she's the best. She's awesome. She defied the Pharaoh and, and, and do it. And, and I want you to understand the people who matter in this story are right here. Shipra and Pua. <laughs> Their names are going in my book, not his. And, and it's an early indicator of something that, 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 that took place. Today, we'll look back and see what took place, and we would call it the law of inversion, right? In the kingdom of God, the law of inversion just simply is the first shall be last, and the humble will be exalted, and a, a little servant will be the greatest of all. And so, folks, when you get baptized, your name goes in the book, God's book. Y- are y'all with me? And it's written in indelible ink. In other words, it can't be removed from God's book. It's, it's secure there. And that's way better than having your name in the cloud, right? I mean, we can talk about doing it in, in, in all the different methods that we, we can do things. But listen, it's secure. You don't have to worry about identity theft. God's got you. Exodus 14, 13 says, do not be afraid. We've already read this, but let me read it again. Do not be afraid. Only stand firm. You will see the deliverance. The Lord will bring you. The Lord will fight for you. And that's a promise. And, and so an important part of baptism is although it's extremely personal, listen, it, it isn't a private thing. It's a public thing. You know, I, I have people that will call me sometimes and say, Jim, can we do a private baptism? And I, I'd say, well, I'd rather not. Well, why not? Because it's meant to be a public thing. It's meant... For everybody to see, I now belong to Jesus. I, I've been marked. I've got a new identity. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a free man or a free woman. It, it, it's out for everybody to see. And this something that God's 
people all went through together. Now listen, we've got a few that have signed up during this service to be baptized. And if you're here and you're ready, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up. Shannon, wherever you're at, if you'll meet people, do it. it. And I'll, I'll just simply say this. If somebody's here and you'd like to celebrate baptism, you'd like to be a part of it, we're going to do it right at the end of this message. We've got everything you need. We've got a change of clothes. We've got towels. We've got undergarments. We've got combs and brushes and the whole works. If you'd like to do it, there's nothing that would stand in the way. I'm going to tell you, any time during the rest of this service, you could stand up and you can head that way, just like I've asked you if you want to come to the cross and, 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 and pray. But, but over the centuries, this promise would give people extraordinary courage for God-powered turnaround stories. What story? The story through the waters, right? The stories of stepping out in faith where I'm scared, where I'm, I'm insecure about it. With that, and and there's a pastor and civil rights leader by the name of Andrew Young, and he writes about how it was on Easter Sunday, 1964. He says that there was a group that planned to go on a march from New Pilgrim Baptist Church to the Birmingham City Jail, where Martin Luther King Jr. was incarcerated for protesting segregation and racism. And this movement was so overwhelmingly Christian. Now, I want to I want to draw into this. So overwhelmingly Christian. Do you know where the march began? And when it began, it began after church, after worship at New. Pilgrim Baptist Church. I mean, I just find that interesting to to much of how we separate church from everything. But this is what Andrew Young writes. He says, by the time the church ended, some 5,000 people had gathered. And listen, they were in their best Sunday clothes. Now listen, for those of you that are under 30, you don't know what that is, but that used to be a thing. You had to wear your best to church. But, but anyway, it, I'm, I'm kind of glad it's no more. But, but uh, anyway, but, but, but the marchers, they set out in joy. I mean, they went out 5,000 strong, excited. But all of a sudden, they saw the police, and they saw the fire trucks, and they saw the firemen with their hoses out. And, and Commissioner Bull... Connor, who had used such brutal tactics even against children marching for civil rights, he ordered them to turn around, and 5,000 of them all fell to their knees and began to pray. Now listen to me. Their pastor, Reverend Charles Billups, one of the oldest leaders of the march, he yelled, the Lord is with this movement. Off your knees, we're going on. Off your knees, we're going on. And Bull Connor was furious, and he yelled, stop them, stop them. Andrew Young writes this, and see if this doesn't get you excited. It says, but none of the police moved a muscle. Even the police dogs that had been growling and straining against their leashes were now perfectly calm. He said, I saw one fireman, tears in his eyes, just let his hose drop to his feet. He said, our people marched right between the red fire trucks, singing an old gospel lament that says, I want Jesus to walk with me. He said, Bull Connor's policemen had refused to arrest us, his firemen had refused to hose us, and his dogs had refused to bite us. But he says, I'll never forget one old woman who became ecstatic when she she marched through the barricades and shouted, great God Almighty, done parted the Red Sea one more time. Folks, I'm going to tell you what, once more when God's people got to the end of that march, something had changed. Something had changed. There was a, they were a little bit different. Freedom was just a little bit stronger. Hate was just a little bit weaker. And, and, and I'm just going to say this to you. I want everybody to connect on this. Whatever problem that you face, whoever your Pharaoh is, whatever might discourage you, these are your words. Listen. Listen to the words of Scripture again. Fear not. Stand firm. See the foundation of the Lord which will work for you. The Lord will fight for you. Who needs to hear that right now? The Lord will fight for you. You have to only to be still, to be still. See, when we march together as a church, maybe it's to help somebody through a natural disaster. I don't know. Maybe it's to help feed the hungry, like through Mountaineer Food Bank, to go serve them at the men's mission, to go serve through the Good Samaritan Free Clinic. Maybe it's to fill backpacks with food. I don't know. There's any number of things. But when the church marches together, (laughs) we never stand alone. We never stand alone. And so when Jesus came 
they tried to stop him too, didn't they? They tried to stop him and with threats of fear. They put him in jail. Folks, the, the scripture says they beat him with a cat of nine tails. You know, we sing songs and make good of it. We crown him with many. Cra- Listen, no, they, they, they took a nasty crown and they rammed it on his head and listen and when he stood still they nailed him to a cross folks I I want you to understand that was his story that was Jesus story and what they didn't know was that the cross is the place where God turns stories around anybody connecting with me right now God turns stories around And, and on the third day What happened? God the Father spoke to God the Son, and he says, get up. I want you to do it. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, victorious over the grave. And now his story can be our story. In fact, when somebody gets baptized, their story becomes Jesus' story. It's a part of that. And if you've never done that, folks, listen to me. If you've never done that, never let the cross mark you. Man, today would be a great day. Right? It'd be a great day. We're set up. We're ready. We're prepared. You know, now's the time. And, 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 and if you have become a believer, but you haven't been baptized, why not? Fear? Pharaoh? Man, God says, Pharaoh who? Pharaoh who? I don't, I don't know his name. Man, I, I'm here to give you a new story. I don't know if if that gets you excited, that gets me excited. A brand new beginning, a new identity, a no more fear kind of life. That's what God says. And so if you want a turnaround story, if you want a turnaround story, I'm going to tell you, just get up. Yeah, it's public. Everybody's going to know. That's the whole point of it. That's the whole point. I want everybody to know, this is my moment. I'm not going to do it. And so if, if you would like to be a part of that, you're welcome, and we've got plenty of room and preparation for you. But, but, but Paul describes this change in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 or something. I don't remember exactly. But it says, we were therefore buried with him, buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a, a, a new life. And so humanly speaking, you might think, my story's over. My story's over. That divorce. Come on, y'all know how you get marked by a divorce? That cancer. That loss of job. That broken relationship. That, that financial woe. That, that scandal. That affair. Come on, we, we could just go all day, couldn't we? I'm so marked. I mean, that abortion, that mental health problem, that crime, that prison term, that scandal. You know, guys, we, we think that's the end for sure. But oh no, it's not. It's only Pharaoh. And God says, I don't even know his name. Anybody here with me? You know, folks, you know, I read a, a post online yesterday that somebody posted and said, said, if you get offended at the folks smoking out front, man, you, you're really not going to like the people inside this building. You know, because inside this building, we've got all those people. We've got adulterers and murderers, and, and, and you, you, you talk it, we've got it here. Folks, the difference is, is what Jesus has done. Pharaoh is going down. It's not the end of the story. Some of you here, I want you to hear me from, from my heart. God wants to free you from your bondage. The, the, the Israelites had been in bondage for 400 years. God set them free, but listen, you, I don't know what you're in bondage to. Most of us have something. God wants to set you free. He wants to, to, to deliver you. And so if you say yes to him, if you go down into that water which is a picture of God, my old life, my sin, my burdens, my old hopes and dreams. I'm surrendering all of that to you so I can be raised up now with Jesus. Then your story is part of Jesus' story. 
Listen, and then along with, with Paul and with Moses and with Shipra and Pua and Dr. Martin Luther King with the Corinthians, you could go on and on, right? I mean, and millions of people over time that now your story becomes part of Jesus' story. Folks, that's changed. And there's a place where human stories get turned around. Where's that at? Folks, look at me. It's at the foot of the cross. There's a place where resurrections happen. It's at the foot of the cross. I mean, we we can talk all day long about everything else. I mean, we could talk about a million things. But listen, what matters is what happens right here at the foot of a cross. It's where deliverance happens. It's where churches find strength and supernatural power. It's where our lives will never be the same. It's where you get a a new story. And, and, And that's what we're celebrating this weekend, and uh, I'm getting ready to go back and baptize a few folks that are back here. But folks, don't, don't run out of here missing it. Listen, some of us entered the room today as slaves, slaves to sin. You're held captive. You feel powerless to overcome. You are. You are. But not with Jesus. I mean, when you, when you step out in obedience to what he's called us to, to a decision, to a life with him, I want you to get it. And so if, you, if you're here and you've accepted Christ but you haven't been baptized, I want you to watch. I want you to watch and see what, 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 what these folks are doing in declaring their faith to everybody else. Are, are you with me, church? Amen. Listen, and there's no shame. Listen, if you wrestle, we want to wrestle with you and walk with you through it. But, but, folks, I'm going to tell you, there, 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 there's no other way. You've got to come to the point of stepping out into the sea. <laughs> it's always that, that moment I've got to die to who I am so that I can become what he wants me to be. Everybody with me? And so I want you, I want you just to, to, to really soak it in because when, when, when people come to this, and I, I, I've got so much more I want to share, but sometimes people come to the cross for me, it was. It was a dramatic difference. I mean, God just so rescued me from my sin, and, and, and it, I had this dramatic change. But some people, it's not like that. Some people come, and it's, it's a long process getting there. They, I, you know, I let go all at one moment, and some people wrestle. And so the change isn't as dramatic, but it's still just as miraculous. It's still just as incredible with that. But the beauty is not what we do. It's not, it's not in, in Jim prayed this prayer or somebody prayed that. No, it's, it's in that Jesus saved a sinner. Right? I want, you to, I, want, I want you to know, today this could be your story. And, and New Life, I, I, I don't know how to put it any other way. Some of, us, some of us, I think we've got a form of what God wants you to have, but we don't really have it. We've got a semblance of it, but we don't really have the real thing. And, and I'm going to tell you, the real thing, you can't have it unless you've died. If any man wishes to come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross. Follow. I mean, it, it's tough. And so, so we're going to go back and we're going to celebrate with two people that I know are back there. And if anybody else would like to come, if you'd like to come another service, you'd like to schedule in the weeks ahead. This isn't about guilt and manipulation. This is, this is, man, I, I'm, I'm challenging you before God. Step out in faith. For those of us that are believers, let's come back to what it's all about. If you haven't come and, and, and prayed and, and let the cross mark you and grab a penny, by all means, come and do that. As I go back to do the baptisms, listen, we're going to celebrate with these folks. And by the way, when that new life comes, I, I just think that ought to be something we celebrate like crazy. Amen, church? And so when they do it, you make sure you let them know that, uh, and you're proud of them, and then afterwards give them big hugs. But let it, let it, let it take you back to what Jesus has done for you. I'm going to go back now.
Yeah.